It's Monday, the 31st of July. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. And on Saturday, 29 July, young rising warbird star Devin Riley and her 20-year-old passenger were killed in their North American AT-6D warbird aircraft in what appears to be a departure from controlled flight stall spin accident from 3,000 feet into Lake Winnebago near Oshkosh. Here's what we know so far. According to the Aviation Safety Network, two fatalities, two occupants, November 4, 9961, a North American AT-6D Texan airplane, November 4, 9961, was destroyed when it impacted Lake Winnebago five minutes after takeoff from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. The private pilot and passenger were fatally injured. The flight originated from Oshkosh. Of course, this is the last weekend or the last, the end of the Oshkosh air show and fly-in. ADSB data and eyewitness accounts suggest the aircraft entered a stall, which developed into a spin. Let's take a look at the ADSB data. Looking now at the ADSB data from ADSB Exchange, they departed runway 27 here at Oshkosh, did a normal climb out at about 113, 130 knots ground speed, climbing up to 3,000 all the way up to 3,700 feet. The elevation of Lake Winnebago is about 700 feet and change. So they're 3,000 feet above the ground or above the water in this case. And if we look at each individual data point here in the lower left corner of your screen, you can see the uh, barometric altitude, GPS altitude, and the vertical rate of climb or descent. So they're climbing at about 500 feet per minute here, and they're slowing to 111 knots ground speed. Not sure what the winds are at this altitude. 3,700 feet, about 500 foot per minute rate of climb. 116 knots, still climbing. 3,800 feet, <clears throat> still climbing. 768 feet per minute. 3,800 feet, climbing at, wow, 1,200 feet per minute. 3,800 feet foot elevation, 1,280 foot per minute, 108 knots, 3,900 feet, still 1,216 to the positive. Now down to 98 knots, 3,900 feet, and about just only 64 feet per minute. Little, little turn in here, little descent, down to 80 knots, and de begin descending at 1,792 feet per minute, down to 71 knots of ground speed, 3,300 feet, descending at a rate, well, that one's at 3,968 feet per minute, and that one is at 10,000 feet per minute. So somewhere right in here, it appears that they have departed controlled flight in the AT-6, and according to eyewitnesses who witnessed the crash, indicated that the aircraft was, in fact, spiraling or spinning into the water. Here they are at 105 knots of ground speed, 77,680 feet per minute rate of descent. And that is the end of the ADSB data. The aircraft involved in the accident, November 4, 9961, is this unrestored AT-6 that was recovered from the Spanish Air Force and was owned by the Riley family and operated through the Texas Warbird Museum. And on this article dated July 20th of 2023, they say that this aircraft will be making its first appearance at both Wings of the North in Eden Prairie, Minnesota this weekend, pre preceding AirVenture, and then at EAA's AirVenture in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. This aircraft was recovered from the Spanish Air Force about 40 years ago and kept in a private airstrip in Georgia for the last 40 years and kept in airworthy condition, but in unrestored condition which is a unique time capsule of a warbird. The article goes on to say that the Spanish lady will be flying into AirVenture in Oshkosh with a mission to encourage people to engage in history. The Riley family can be found at events and fly-ins with a line of people waiting to see their aircraft as they enjoy engaging with the public and passing on the history of these lovely warbirds. Flying and sharing the history is a family affair. Both Jeremy Riley, father, Hunter Riley, son, are experienced pilots with Devin Riley, wife of Hunter, a newly minted T-6 pilot. Devin just soloed in this e T-6 two months prior to Oshkosh. 
Devin leaves a pretty clear flying history on her Instagram account. She received her private pilot's license in August of 2017. By the time of her 26th birthday, she had achieved about 100 hours in a high-performance checkout in a Cessna 182. She began flying a BT-13 in 2019, flew Stearman's, uh, flew a Stearman in uh, March of 2020, received her instrument rating in December of 2020, was two ship carded in the BT-13. That means she was formation qualified to fly a two ship formation through the NADA, the North American Training Association, who does all the carding of the Warbird pilots. By June 19th of 2022, she had 500 hours and flew her first formation air show at the Fagan Fighter Memorial Air Show. She also had a lot of theater experience and was involved in the film Rise Above about the WASPs, the women pilots of World War II, the ferry pilots. And that's what she was promoting at Oshkosh. In March 5th of this year, she received her four-ship wing formation card rating from NADA, the North American Training Association. Did her commercial written here on, um, let's see, the February of 23, and then soloed in the T-6 in May 27th of 2023. So, though Devin had her first 500 hours under her belt, she was freshly soloed in the AT-6, and she was right in the middle of the curve that all of us have to safely get through the first 500 hours of our flying experience until we achieve over a thousand hours of flying time, at which time statistically our chances of having an accident get reduced greatly. And even though the young cadets during World War II were flying these aircraft with much less flying time, they were completely immersed in a flying training program of aerobatics, formation, and spin training that is nothing like today's of civilian flying training. And even with that said, the accident rate during World War II in training exceeded that of combat losses during training when operating these kind of warbird aircraft. This first 500 hour hump of likelihood of being involved in an accident within the first 500 hours of your flying career is is typical of any endeavor it's the we don't know what we don't know part of our learning of a new career or a new endeavor unfortunately spin training is no longer taught in civilian flight training in military flight training, it was taught all the time. It's right out of the gate, you're, that's what you're doing. Stalls, spins, formation flying. But not that's not the case in civilian flying training. And if we take a look at the old AT-6 manual, there's a lot of interesting information about the spin characteristics of a t an AT-6. As I always say on this channel, you can stall an aircraft at any indicated airspeed at any attitude, but only one critical angle of attack. And of course, as you increase the angle of bank of the aircraft, you are going to increase your indicated stall speed. The AT-6 is a relatively heavy aircraft, weighing in at between five and 6,000 pounds as it approaches gross weight. Right here in the manual, it tells you that just to do stalls, the, you need to practice your stalls that, such that you will recover at a safe altitude of 4,000 feet above the terrain. Now, according to the book, it says that stalls in the AT-6 are not violent and you can normally feel a normal stall approaching as the control, controls begin to loosen up and the airplane develops a sinking, mushing feeling. But most of us that have flown the AT-6 have found that it's a pretty abrupt stall generally to the right. Now, for intentional spinning of the AT-6, the book says the minimum altitude for intentionally entering a spin is 10 thousand feet above the terrain. That's going to give you an indication of just <laughs> the unique spin characteristics of the AT-6. They make these trainer aircraft such that you have to intentionally do the correct procedure to recover from the spin. They're training you how to fly the airplane by recovering from the spin. This does not meet the typical FAA requirements for light aircraft where most light aircraft will generally recover from a spin merely if you let go of the controls because they are so inherently stable. That's not the case with aircraft like the AT-6 
or the uh, T-37 that uh, I instructed in for so many years in the Air Force. Spin recovery. This is right out of the T6 manual. Recovery from normal or inverted spins is affected by vigorous application of full opposite rudder, followed by stick movement slightly forward of neutral for normal spins and slightly aft of neutral for inverted spins. If you've ever tried those before, that's confusing. Leave ailerons neutral. Immediately following application of the recovery re controls, the nose of the airplane will drop and the spin will accelerate rapidly for approximately one half to three fourths of a turn. This is the part where if this happens to you inadvertently and that water or ground starts coming rushing up to you, you're gonna do the wrong thing and try to pull away from the ground and that's just gonna exacerbate the spin and ensure that the spin continues. Hold the controls in this position until the spin stops. Then immediately relax rudder pressure to neutral so you don't start spinning the other direction. Slowly apply, apply back pressure to the stick to round out the dive and regain level flight attitude. During the final recovery from an inverted spin, you may half roll from the inverted dive before applying pre back pressure on the stick to round out the dive. And if we look at the diagram over here on, on the left, it takes a while for the T6 to settle into its uh, spin characteristics. But you're going to lose about 500 feet per rotation of the spin. Approximately 500 feet of altitude is lost per turn after the spin stabilizes. There's an excellent video by my friend Scott Perdue who goes up and shows us some spins in the AT6 and stalls and stall prevents and shows us from the cockpit of what this looks like. And with his permission, let's look at that video now. Speaking of fun, well, let's get to the meat of this particular video and uh, we're going to start with spin prevents. If you ha you're in the traffic pattern and you have overshooting winds, something like that, and you depart the airplane, well, if you don't recover it, you're going to die. And the odds are if you let spin develop, you are. So the idea is to prevent that spin to begin with. And how you do that is when the airplane starts to slice, just like in our video there, you go forward stick to break the AOA, get that boundary layer reattached, and then you use the rudder to recover. And then you recover from the dive, and hopefully you have plenty of altitude to do that. Spin prevent. So the first thing you do in the stall, or and when the airplane starts to slice, you recognize it, oh my gosh. So then you unload and then use the rudder to correct it, and then you have prevented the spin, recover from the dive, and we should be fine. Okay, next up is the spin. We set it up the same way as the spin prevent. We clear the area, and then we, with a nice amount of altitude above the ground, and then we stall it. And once we stall it, we kick left rudder, we're gonna hold it. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna stabilize the spin. Idle, neutral, aft, okay? The idle part of it is, is uh, we want to pull the power back, we neutralize the ailerons and then we go full aft on the stick. We go full aft on the stick so we prevent, uh, present as much of the rudder as possible to the relative wind so it's going to be effective when we stop the yaw. So idle, neutral, aft, and then uh, and we do those because if you remember the accelerated spin video, we don't want to accelerate the spin and make it harder to recover. So here we go. Left rudder and the spin the departures there. I don't need to laugh, stabilize the spin. We're spinning left and right rudder. And then take out the rudder, pop the forward stick, and recover from the back. No big deal. We'll get the nose above the horizon and we'll minimize our altitude. So I highly recommend it that you go out there and get some training from somebody and spin recoveries. and It'll build your confidence level, there's no doubt, because it's just another regime that happens with the airplane. Hopefully, you can see that if you approach this thing in a controlled uh, manner, that uh, spinning it or departing it is not a big deal. It's just, like I said, just another regime, just something that happens. And you can get form more comfortable flying the airplane and uh, staying away from those dark corners that uh, can bite you. So, the, but the important takeaway, I think, to remember about this is not the spin recovery itself and how to do it, what the mantra is, Etc. It's actually how to prevent the spin from happening. Whereas, because if uh, you're in the pattern, traffic pattern, a spin recovery is not going to save your life, but a spin prevent will. So, just avoid getting into that uh, departure altogether. You prevent the yaw or stop the yaw and uh, reattach that boundary layer, prevent the stall, and then fly out. That's the best thing to do. Just don't depart to begin with. 
With each generation of modern flight training, we lose some of the information and knowledge that our forebearers knew intuitively and instinctively. And the tragic loss of Devin Riley reminds all of us parents who have children that we would like to see get involved with aviation. Keep them safe and not push them beyond their limits, especially within the first 500 or 1,000 hours of their flying career. And help guide them in their aeronautical decision making. Thank you so much for your support of this channel. See you here.